Hello, my name is Madison Dedia, and this is my wrongful conviction presentation on Marvin Anderson for JUS 360. My agenda for what will be discussed during this presentation is how Marvin Anderson was wrongfully convicted and served 15 years in prison and four years on probation before being exonerated, how he was exonerated based on an introduction of new DNA evidence, how his case followed the internal critique of law, how state law surrounds this case, and how this case is an example of critical race theory, and how Karl Marx's perspective is a socio-legal perspective that helps in understanding this case, and my conclusion. I will first be discussing the facts and timeline of this case. July 17, 1982, a young white woman was brutally beaten, threatened with a gun, raped, and sodomized by a black man she did not know who approached her on a bicycle. After she reported her crime, a police officer singled Anderson out because the perpetrator told the young white woman about having a white girl. Anderson was the only man known to be living with a white woman, according to the officer. After being wrongfully ID'd and withstanding trial on December 14, 1982, Anderson was convicted by an all-white jury of robbery, forcible sodomy, abduction, and two counts of rape. He was sentenced to 200 years and 10 days in Virginia State Penitentiary. A couple years later, in 1988, the man whose people suspected actually committed the crime, John Otis Lincoln, came forward and admitted his involvement in the crime. The reason people suspected John was because he was the owner of the bicycle, but said that someone had stole the bicycle an hour before the crime occurred. However, even with his confession, the judge declared him a liar. This is the same judge that presides Anderson's trial. Two big things happened in 2001 for Anderson, the first being that Virginia adopted a new statute that permits felons to ask for a new scientific analysis to be tested of previously untested scientific evidence, and the second being that the Innocent Project, which accepted his case in 1994, filed for a retest under the new statute. On December 6, 2001, the results excluded Anderson as the perpetrator, making him the 99th person to be exonerated in the U.S. due to the post-conviction DNA testing. And on August 21, 2002, he was officially pardoned. This next slide is about critical issues. The critical issues in this case are the introduction of new DNA evidence, misidentification from the victim, and inadequate defense. The victim misidentified her perpetrator. Since this was Anderson's first offense, officers retrieved an identification card for him. The victim was shown a color identification card for Anderson and half a dozen black and white mugshots. In this, she chose Anderson. Then an hour later, in a lineup, Anderson was the only person in the lineup that was in the previous pictures before. Again, she chose Anderson. One could speculate that these are the same reasons that she chose Anderson as a perpetrator. Another critical issue was the DNA results. It wasn't until Virginia's statute permitting individuals conduct, convicted of a felony to ask the circuit court that entered the original conviction to order new scientific analysis of previously untested evidence, evidence that police officers told Anderson's lawyer was destroyed. Without crime analysis, Mary Jane Burton, who kept the samples in her notebook, Anderson would not be a free man. And the last critical issue critical issue being that during Anderson's trial, he asked his counsel to have John Otis Lincoln as a witness and his counsel denied him. The next thing we'll be talking about on this slide is law and social control. Anderson's case was only involved on the state level. It was never taken to the federal level. State law in America, according to our textbook, is typically covers matters such as homicide, burglary, rape, arson, auto theft, larceny, and others like it. The specific statute as stated in the first two slides is Virginia's VA code section 19.2-327.1. The next slide is about the type of jurisprudence involved in the case. In this case, it is the critical race theory. The critical race theory as defined in our textbook is the theory that people of color bring a unique perspective to the legal systems and this perspective can advance people's understandings of some challenges confronting the system of law as well as society in general. Critical race theory see law as racist. Also shown in this case a part of critical race theory is critical race realism which in our textbooks attempts to draw upon the social sciences to expose racial bias and document its harmful exposure consequences. Some examples of this are how Anderson was convicted by an all-white jury, the victim was white and the perpetrator was black, Anderson was singled out because he lived with a white woman, and how John Otis Lincoln 
the actual perpetrator, another black man, was labeled a liar by a judge after he confessed to committing the crime. The next slide is about the socio-legal perspective, and I'll be looking closely at Karl Marx's perspective. According to our text, Marx's idea about law are that law is a reflection of the political economy. It is complicit in oppression and exploitation, and that is exactly what happened in Anderson's case. Society claims to protect our rights and serve justice, but Anderson was not protected, and he was not issued justice for almost 20 years. Our justice system failed him. Marx says our capitalist law preserves the privilege and denies the majority of members a fulfilling life. Who are the majority? People of color. Anderson, a black man. He was denied a fulfilled life for 20 years. The next slide talks about the critique of law. The connection I focus on that relates to this case is the internal critique of law. The reason I chose to focus on this, focus on this is because the internal critique of law sees law as an institution that is abused and used. According to our textbook, law favors the privileged. This connects with Karl Marx's idea as well. The connection I mostly focus on is that if Marvin Anderson was a white man, would he still have been convicted of this crime? One can speculate that he wouldn't. In conclusion, what happened to Marvin Anderson should not have happened. An innocent man was sent to prison because he had a white girlfriend and he was a black man. This case shows misidentification, government misconduct, and an inadequate defense. Thank you.